Anna. I'm, I'm well, Lewis. I am well, thank you. I'm, I'm, in fact, I'd say I'm incredibly excited because not only is this our 30th episode of Shouting Into the Void, also we are live streaming it on Instagram, which is incredibly exciting. I'm extremely excited by this. Yeah, yeah. If, if I, when you're listening to this, if you can hear a sort of <laughs> echo, it's not because we're in a wide open space. It's because Lewis and I <laughs> are colossal morons. Yes, we <laughs> are colossal morons. Through. This is very true. We, we certainly are. Uh, but, you know, it's, 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 part, it's part of what makes this job so appealing. Uh, <laughs> I keep forgetting to look. I keep forgetting to look at my phone. And I keep forgetting that that that, uh, that people are watching, uh, and we're not going to be answering many questions because we've got uh, a fuck ton to review. So um, yeah. So should we do? Indeed. We do yeah, let's have some bullshit. Go on. Let's have a cheeky bit. Okay, I'm gonna. I'm gonna spin. The okay, wheel. you spin that conveniently off-camera wheel that definitely exists. We promise. Yeah. <laughs> Broke. Oh, I need some oil. Oh no. Um, life hacks. <laughs> life hacks. Very good. Um, yeah. I I have many life hacks that I use in my day to day life, and you will be glad to know that they are all crushingly dull. Yes, I, I'm sure. I'm sure they are, but I would expect nothing less. <laughs> um. I'm a very boring person. <laughs> You chose to say yes to doing the podcast with me, Danny, and here we are. You're making a podcast with arguably the most boring man alive. Well, I mean, that's it's not it's not something that many people can say, and I'm happy to have the opportunity. Um, well, fantastic! Yeah, big fantastic. slurp for the edit there. Um, oh so, yeah, okay, that, so that slurp's getting cut out. What's your first, What's your first life hack, Lewis? My first life hack. My first life hack is if you boil water. Before you freeze it, you it will be clear. The ice cubes will be clear, which is good for making like cocktails and stuff like that. Because then you have perfectly clear ice, and it looks gorgeous, stunning. Wow! Uh, yeah, because see, I, just I've as dull long, as you were expecting. I've long had a problem with foggy ice, and now my my prayers <laughs> have been answered in the form of a man from Stoke. <laughs> Yeah, some bloke from the Midlands has now solved all of your ice-based woes. So, so, so what of my woes? What can you, you, a man from Glasgow? What can you solve about my woes? Um, this had better be good. I'm trying. I'm trying very hard not to cry, Daniel. Please bring joy to my soul. Uh, <laughs> if you have a. If you have a, if you get some grapes, right? Um, right. And and you, you get one grape, right? Let's say this this is a grape, right? And you spend up to ten minutes tearing the, the skin off with your teeth. Yes. Right. It, yeah. it tastes nicer. I. Not only do I not believe you, I also don't think that's a life hack because that seems like a lot more effort than just it is a, chucking it's, it in. It's, you're, you're putting a bit more effort in to get a tastier product. So I mean, take the bitter skin off and then you just get the, the sweet grape. I can't be the only person that does that. I I think in bitterness in food, it lends itself to sweetness in food. Does that make sense? No. Like if you put a bit of salt on something that's like a bit sweet, it makes it more interesting. Like a salted caramel. No. <laughs> the, the, okay, the, the well... Flip. The two flavors can never mix for me. It's like, um, like I would never eat a uh, salted and sweet popcorn. Oh, that's the ever. best popcorn. No, no. Because it's lucky dip. Know. Then you go in, you go in, not knowing what you're gonna get. See if I wanted a lucky dip, Lewis. I would have <laughs> got a lucky dip. I want salted popcorn. And do you know, see one time, yeah, I had a big bowl of it, right? And, mm-hmm. and, and I was at this uh, friend's house, and they put. <laughs> sweet popcorn in as well and mixed it all around and I took one bite and guess what what I didn't like it (laughs) (laughs) I think they complement each other they go they go together well no and prepare yourself for for some pretentiousness from your favorite bloke from the Midlands this evening yeah go on Um, give me some pretentiousness 
sweetness in food complements, prepare yourself for this, umami flavour. I think they complement each other. Like mushrooms, mushrooms go well with sweet things, like caramelised onion and mushroom. That's, that's a good combination. See, I think I'm right. What's that word you used again? Umami. It's like, I think it's like a Japanese word or something. It's like um like a savoury flavour that's not salty, like mushrooms. It's like a savoury flavour, but it's not very, very salty. See, you don't even know what you're talking about. You don't even know where the word comes from. You're like, I think it might be a Japanese word. Right, right, right. How many of your words that you use every day? Can you just say, yes, This I definitely know all of the origins for this word. Every single word. Every single one. You're, you're pulling Only a... One um, word that I've said. Go on. Um, you put me in the spot now. Blood. Can you name the origin of that word? Uh, yeah. Oh, can you? Go on then. It's, um... It, it's derived from uh, the Latin word. Right. Uh, which, which is... Which, uh, uh, blue... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm waiting. Uh, no, it's on the tip of my tongue. It's um, it's a uh, uh, blue dunu. Oh, it. is it? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've just googled it, and um, that's not right. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, the word blood comes from the old English blood, uh, which is of Germanic origin, of course, and it's related to the German blut and the Dutch bluid. So there we That's go. Now we know. I told you that. And you yes, like, you said. No, 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 I'll look at. That's exactly what I said. I you said, said it was about Latin, see, but no, no, it's it's come no, from no, no, Holland. No. It's come from see Holland. See what you've just said. No, what Danny. You've just said. Italy I and Holland said. are not the same place. <laughs> the I words refuse you to just believe said, that all I the different said. European countries are the same. And you don't have any proof. <laughs> no, I have a, a spurious Google search result. <laughs> that, that is my my explanation for this, but no, no I have no. no, no. I, don't, I don't mean that you don't have proof of where the word comes from. You don't have proof that I said it was Latin. No, I don't. I don't have. Well, I mean, we are recording this. Uh, yeah, but <laughs> it will be edited. So yes, I, yeah, don't the... worry. I will edit out the bit that incriminates you. Don't don't fret. <laughs> Were we not talking about life hacks a minute? For, and now yeah. we're on to the, the origin of the word blood. Uh, yeah, we, we were What's another about life, life hack, hack Lewis? Um, what, another life hack that comes up on my Facebook sometimes is that if you like putting fresh herbs in your food, but they always just, like, don't last very long, then you should chop them up and freeze them in ice cubes. And then if you're like, oh, this dish could do with a bit of thyme, then you get a thyme ice cube and throw the ice cube in. And then, bam, your dish is much more tiny. What's your obsession with ice cubes? Is this, is this, have you taken pasta? Has pasta been discarded and now you're on the ice cubes? Yes, completely. I made my own stock. I froze it. Now I am all about ice cubes. That's where I'm at. Oh my god. Does, does, does not a lot happen in Stoke? Is it like... <laughs> we are on lockdown! Yeah, I know, but like... You, don't put... Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't pretend that you wouldn't talk about this when when things are back to not. This is a conversation point that you would bring up when if 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 it was a golden age of economics, you would talk about this shit. That's probably true, actually. Yeah. If we were always out doing stuff, I probably would still say, you know, I think I might try making my own stock tonight. I'm going to try boiling celery and leeks and onions for three hours and see if that has a nice flavour. Yeah. That is exactly the kind of thing I would talk about. Yeah. Oh God, you. Can you can you you repeat that please? It broke up a wee bit there. I said that um, even if we were in an economic brilliance, if we're going out every night, getting hammered in, in in the in the brief interludes between get drinking heavily, I would say, you know, what I think I might do tonight instead of going out and get. I might like just boil some celery and onions and carrots for three hours and see if that's nice. That's the kind of thing I'd do. Okay, just one more time for luck. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, we might be having trouble on the live. Can you hear me on Skype? I can hear you on Skype. Your face looks like a, a Francis Bacon portrait on the live, though. Oh, I'm sure it'd be fine. Or a, sm oh, fine. Or a smudged child's drawing. <laughs> uh, That's just my face, Daniel. How dare you say that? 
Uh, uh, have you got any more life hacks, or do you feel do do you feel sated on the bullshit level? I'm sure I'm sure there's another life hack, isn't there? Uh, Definitely. We we haven't we haven't done all of them. <laughs> No. Yeah, there's not all of the life hacks in the world. We've just knocked them out in a quick ten minutes. Um, every single yeah, life yeah, hack yeah. in the in the history of the world. See if um, uh, life hack, life hack, life hack. It's not, why is it called a life hack? I don't know why it's called a life hack because. The idea of hacking, it, like... called before computers? A life improvement device. A life improvement yeah. strategy. That's what it was called. L- life life sorcery or something like that? Is that what it was <laughs> called? <laughs> life necromancy. Yeah, that's the one. Life wizardry. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a life hack in itself, isn't it? Yeah, necromancy. Yeah, that one, that old... That, it's, it's a... It's a, 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 I was watching um, Would I Lie to You before before coming on here and um, Lee Mack was talking about the uh, the, the game uh, you know the Ouija board yeah yeah and he's like it was he was like yeah it's you know it's a, it was back before the internet and things were really boring so you had to find something to do and David Mitchell was like yes like dabble in the occult <laughs> That is that is kind of a mood, and in a very strange way, that is kind of a mood. Definitely, definitely. Well, I mean, I think I'm, I think I'm life hacked out. I think I've been hacked. I think I have also been hacked to death in in the phrase of yeah. my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Darius makes sure, an excellent sure. point, by the way. This is very professional. Is it us? Is that I haven't even I haven't even I know. Been the questions. I, I, every now and then, I, I look over to my phone and there's a couple of a couple of bits and bobs in the chat. Darius makes the point that this is very professional, and it's extremely professional. I'm here with my incredibly really janky mic setup. That's my improvised pop shield. You can't see, but my mic's there, and it's a webcam that's vaguely pointed in the direction of my face. I have a new microphone. We talked about this before. I have a new microphone, oh, did you, and did you... um, it arrived, and I got it out, and I was putting it all together. I was like, oh, this is great. It looks fantastic. And I was looking at the instructions, and I was putting it all together, plugged it in, and it doesn't work. And then I looked deeper into the instructions and it says, you might need a power supply. And I went, oh, God. So I then ordered a power (laughs) supply and it should be arriving in the near future. So that's nice. Oh, damn. Um, Well, I mean, good good luck with that, I guess. (laughs) I feel, you know, I I feel really self-conscious because usually when we're doing this, I can just sort of let let do that to to the microphone as you're speaking. But now I have to sort of put on a sh- <laughs> put on a show, and I keep looking. I used I keep looking behind me to see how what time we're on, and if my computer hasn't died in it's obscurity, because mm. it does that. Doesn't it do that? Doesn't it? Like, it it does. A yeah. Podcast? At the most critical points, it dies. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, half of your recording is lost. <laughs> At the points marked, and, and it's all fixed in the edit. A lot of my work um, in the edit is just sort of editing out bits where at least one of our audio has mysteriously cut out. It's like half a sneeze, but it's like, well, clearly there was another half to that sneeze, and then we talked about, like, Darth Vader for 20 minutes. What the hell's going on here? Oh, Zach has joined. Hi, Zach. All right, mate. We have... Hi, Zach. Uh, we've, never, we've never talked about Darth Vader before. No, we haven't talked um, about Darth Vader. It's probably because I've never really watched Star Wars. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a uh, the new films are are, are, are crap. Um, I would I would review them, but no. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to do the original trilogy one day to discover. Yeah, the original trilogy is good. What uh, is when is are rubbish? When Star Wars Day? That's May the fourth, isn't it? Is is May has May yeah. already happened? No, May's next month, isn't it? Yeah. So for for May the fourth, we'll we'll do the the original trilogy. But, I mean, I'm just saying okay, this off of the random. Sunday? I mean, yeah, it almost certainly won't be a Sunday, and I'll almost certainly yeah. forget this this conversation ever happened. But in theory, we could do that. So you know, that's exciting. So so you don't know when May is, 
could <laughs> first of all, you're like, wait, has May happened yet? I, just, is, I genuinely is, don't know the order what year of the is months. It? <laughs> this is a genuine issue. I, I, anybody, anybody that knows me very well will attest to this. My, uh, my wife will attest to this. I do not know the order of the months. It is a genuine problem in my life. If somebody says, "Oh yeah, such and such is happening on in June," I, I might have to sit there and think, "Is it already?" Has June happened yet? Have we had the summer? I genuinely have no idea. It's not good. Chloe's put in the chat. I, I don't know them at all. It's true. I don't know the months. That May the 4th is, is on is a sh- Monday this year. Well, it might be perfect then. Yeah, maybe. 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 I mean, maybe. we could re- record it in the Monday, but like... like <laughs> or the week before. <laughs> right, well... We've done plenty of bullshit now. Do you feel sated? Oh, Danny's left. Yeah, well, guess... Yeah, I'm still here, don't worry. Um, I just said to... Uh, do go live with O'Hiram. There we go. Yeah. This is, this is really professional, by the way. This is... We are doing so well at this. The thing is... No, <laughs> to some degree, I feel like it's going brilliantly, even though I know it's not. The level of shitness is making me feel like it's going better than it actually is. For God's sake, wait a minute. We're not cutting any of this out, folks. No, no, this, this is all staying in. <laughs> <laughs> the unedited podcast. Lots of me going, oh, where's Daddy gone? Um, oh no, the Wi-Fi is being a bit weird. Oh no, things are going badly. <laughs> Danny's a... All, 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 all we need to happen now is a pet to die, and that'll cement the. <laughs> oh my God, what? Why are we saying something, that a pet something... needs to die? Christ! Because, because why would anything go right? <laughs> well, does that? Um... Okay, okay, right, right. We've 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 done the... <laughs> we've done the hard bit. <laughs> yes, we've had plenty of plenty of bullshit. I feel sated for that now. Um, what film are we talking about on this on this fine Monday evening, Daniel? Well, it is my favourite film of all time because number three is my favourite number of all time. So I wanted to book in uh, number thirty because mm-hmm. you know I could have just done number three, but like it had to be a big event. So, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So we are doing uh, there will be blood. Uh, and it's uh, you can tell it's a sort of film I enjoy, uh, and it was <laughs> it was written and directed by Paul Thomas Anderson. It is based mm. on uh, the book by Upton Sinclair Oil. No, no, no! It's it's, n- it's not oil. It's oil. There's an exclamation mark down there. You have to oil. Yeah. It's it's, it's like mother, isn't it? It's like that, that mother. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> we did we did that. Uh, I'm getting to my book. We did that uh, for the. Uh, the number 20, didn't we? We did do uh, that for number 20. What did we do for 10? Did we do anything for 10? I genuinely can't even remember. Anyway, we're getting very immediately sidetracked. We did Rick and Morty, didn't we? We did, yes, we did Rick and Morty, I remember. And, and Zach put in his, his two pence worth. He did indeed, yes. Um, and actually, it is worth mentioning, on this episode 30, where we're talking about There Will Be Blood... Our excellent friend of the show, Darius, has uh, made some fantastic artwork, which will be going up with the social media post we do for this episode. I really like it. The one thing you have to say about this film is the cinematography is excellent. And another thing you have to say is that Darius's Photoshop skills are similarly excellent. Therefore, I like the artwork very much. They certainly are. They certainly are. Um, I know I haven't responded to your email, Darius. I, I, <laughs> I, I promise I will. You'll he'll, he'll try. <laughs> I'll put it on my to-do list. First thing tomorrow morning, 5am. The second I get up, I'll get on it. He's very lazy, Darius. Just send send me your emails, right? And, and I'll sort you out. <laughs> very, yeah. Very. Anyway, send Chloe your emails. <laughs> um, yes, okay. So it's, uh, it's starring Daniel Day-Lewis, Paul Dano, Dylan Fraser, uh, Kevin J. O'Connor, and Kirian Hines. Yeah. So, do you, do you have an opening statement for this lovely film? <clears throat> I do, yes. Prepare yourself. Um, a bleak tale of greed in a glowing world. 
Does Plainview represent the dark side of the American dream in a world where the American dream hasn't really been concocted and released yet? It does not surprise me that this is your favourite film, Danny. It's very bleak. <laughs> it, 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 it certainly is. Um, well, <clears throat> an odyssey of primal ambition, mm-hmm. religion, hatred, and most importantly, blood. A character study of a man that finds the allure of success more important than human connection and resigns himself from warmth and decency. Yeah, I mean, that's accurate. I've got to say. I agree. Yeah. Um, so creep, creepy room questions, Lewis. Why don't, why don't you kick us off? Right. This is not really much to do with the film, but it's very loosely related. Wouldn't living in the Old West be really shit? Yeah. It would just be awful. Yeah. You'd be, like, dying of dysentery all the time, and, like, everything is yeah, dirty, yeah. and, like, your mates might just drown in an oil well or something how off I'm right it's not good I'm going to pretend I heard you there <laughs> that you didn't break up yes I agree yeah completely uh, you, you take your you take your life in your hands as you go to the toilet in the old west it's, it's really it's really horrible it is incredibly intense and this this film I do admire how this film it doesn't paint sort of a romanticised picture of the old west it paints like a very um, an honest picture in a lot of ways like like the opening scenes where, where um, like he's in that silver mine or whatever, wherever he is and it just looks horrible yeah. and you're just like yeah okay it's a pretty horrible pretty bleak existence to be honest with you do you know what I mean I mean he doesn't like he's he literally all he does is just swing a pickaxe for like a mm. living and just hope that he'll come across uh, silver mm. and then mm. he, he breaks his leg and just drag himself through the through the desert to get to the town so that he can be he can be seen to medically. It's, what a grueling, horrible existence to live in. Mm, it does so not sound like a fun can, time. No, you can imagine how someone like that could become so mm. uh, ambitious and just cutthroat. Mm, completely, yeah. I agree completely, yeah. A, co- a commenter has, has made a very interesting point. Uh, my... Uh, Maya fan club eight has said uh, the characters are Eli and Daniel. That's very uh, true. They it's, are. It's, an, it's another reason that, that I love this film so much. The parallels between myself <laughs> and the film. My name is Dan, and I play a person called Eli. It's like, oh my god, it was it was made for me. Um, <laughs> but the names of the characters are very interesting. Uh, Daniel is Hebrew for a God is my judge. Mm-hmm. Um, so what Eli you're saying is it's the old school a... version of a tattoo that says only God can judge me. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Oh, nice. Daniel, nice. Daniel hates Daniel hates God. You know, he's he's very anti-religious and, and sees it as a as a, an opportunity uh, to to manipulate people. Mm. Um, mm. And Eli is a Hebrew for high or elated okay or elevated um hw it it, it could it could mean like his word because i think mm-hmm. daniel almost sees himself as like a god almost. yeah like he's the way he speaks it's like uh, uh if i say i'm an oil man you will agree mm. it's not uh you should agree it's like no i'm telling you that you will mm. and uh it's it's as if it's, the biblical references are like so deeply tied into the film. It's mm. um, Paul, who's a, who's Eli's brother, means small or humble. So it's yeah, like all these sort of biblical names are being tied in together, which is mm. a nice mm. wee sort of a. It's very thematic. Mm. It's a fantastic point you make about um, how Daniel sort of views himself as a god because he kind of. It's something I hadn't considered, but he kind of does in a way. Maybe, maybe not like a a, a a god in the classic sort of Bible sense, but more in a sort of a force of nature type way, if that makes sense. Yeah, almost like almost like a um, sort of Nietzsche's uh, idea of the Ubermensch. Yeah, yeah, the, completely. You know, this this every man this this a uh, you know, Superman essentially. 
Mm, and that's mm. it's very, it's very Nietzschean. It's very sort of cynical of 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 religion, or, or specifically Eli, who is in the exact same vein as Daniel. But he mm. he doesn't he doesn't believe in it. He just he we learn quite quickly that he uses it in the same way that Daniel uses business to gain mm, mm. Uh, p- power and influence. Um, so Daniel just sort of recognises Eli as another as another trickster, another con man, and that's why he can't stand him, because he is just competition, yeah. essentially. And that's the strange thing, in a way. It's as much as Daniel is a trickster, and he is a con man, uh, he he does eventually do some actual business. He he does he is still selling oil for money. Do you know what I mean? That yeah. that's he's still making that transaction. But like Eli, at no point is that a thing. Do you know what I mean? He's not yeah. selling access to the church on a subscription basis, or <laughs> like a Netflix subscription you know or something. Do you know what I mean? It, I think it's it's a very strange thing. It's um when when Daniel sort of like arrives at the town and is sort of given his big speech about how he's going to bring. Uh, education and food and grain and all these things that uh, little Boston hasn't had before. Mm. It's literally just shots of men setting up the oil rig. Yeah. It's yeah. like, oh, my men will be bringing their families and, and everyone will be together. And it's literally just shots of men, you know, setting up for work. So it is just, it's just a big fraud. Mm. Mm. Um, and you don't, you, you don't really have any reason to think that at the start of the film because Daniel's like you're on Daniel's side when you see this guy who's just working his way he's really working really hard yeah right? he's, yeah he's trying to get you know all, uh, silver and then he, he builds a wee oil rig and then uh, HW's dad uh, dies and um, he takes uh, HW as his, as his adopted son and we don't really have any reason to believe that Daniel has any malicious intent mm. for him mm. and it slowly sort of revealed that the reason that Daniel took HW is because he needed a you know a face to sort of make him seem a bit make kinder him more palatable yeah. to buy land mm. which is yeah so it's pretty it's pretty horrible yeah and the one thing I do wonder whenever I see that sort of opening to this film it, was it always Daniel's plan to weaponize the child in a way, or did he just take the child and think, "Well, this might come in handy later on"? I just don't know. Do you know what I mean? Or was he always from the start thinking, I, "There is definitely some way I can use this child to my advantage," and there, and then eventually he's like, "Okay, yeah, well, I, I guess I can play the pity me, I have a son. Let me buy your land, sort of thing." Well, Daniel, I think is um, he's he wants to be this this cold, uh, calculating, just emotionless businessman. Sure, but I sure. I think he's he's burdened with this need for human connection. Mm. And while it's true that he definitely did take HW to to get leases and 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 to and to buy land, I don't think I think Daniel does love HW. To mm. a degree, but he just lo- he just loves oil and money more. Mm. I do think it's it's sort of um, it's almost like a weird ingrained thing in in the lizard brain within his his human brain. His his, his sort of central brain is like there's some part of him that's thinking, yes, well, I do need human contact and I do need people to 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 be close to and to talk to and to do whatever. And I think that's it's not necessarily his downfall. It's it's the thing that he doesn't understand about himself. And that, that's where a lot of the, his internal conflict comes in the film is, well, I, I mean, it's just going to be best if I use the, my adopted son as, as, an, as an excuse to, as an advantage in trades and deals and whatever. And he also, while he's doing that, it's like, yeah, well, you know, it is going to be kind of rubbish to send him to boarding school because I do enjoy having him around, even though he doesn't really understand yeah. that that's what he feels. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting because, see, after he gets his, his oil... Or not, he, he he gets his silver, mm. and then he starts trying to uh, mine. F- uh, is it mine? drill for oil? Sorry. Mm. Um, he has a companion throughout the entire film. From that point on, he has 
uh, his business partner, who's HW's dad. Sure. Then he is then he is HW, and then when HW goes deaf, he sends him away, and then his brother, who we later find out to be an imposter, turns up. Mm. So that he's still maintaining this family image, and still has someone that he can sort of, you know, speak to and be and be close to. Mm. And then by the end of the film, when he's severed all ties with HW. He talks about, oh, this is my closest associate. He hears everything. So he always has someone. Yeah, you know, yeah. He's, he's, he's terribly misanthropic. He mm. hates people with a passion and just sees everyone as a competitor. But he's paradoxically lonely because of it. Mm. Yeah, I, I completely agree. He hates that about himself, that he still he feels the need to have a sort of uh, mm. you know, connection with someone. He's a very complicated character, and it's a very Daniel Day Lewis performance. And I think you'll understand what I mean by that, in that it's it's a very it's very nuanced. Not a lot of it is played big. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. He, he's Some playing a is, playing a character, playing a like, character. If that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's when when Daniel sends uh, H.W. away. I, I, this was pointed out by another reviewer of the film, mm-hmm. and if you look like, really closely you'll see him sort of uh, put his hand on his shoulder and you'll see like, a single tear mm. drop. So it's like, there's it can't be denied that he has emotional feelings for HW. And then sure. he's walking away and he's sort of like scrunching his face up mm. and suppressing the, the, the feeling. It's, it's heartbreaking. Mm. It's a really heartbreaking um, uh, scene, I think. Uh, yeah, completely. Don't don't be alarmed, right? But uh, I relate more to Daniel Plainview than any other character in existence. Well, I am most certainly alarmed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. I just okay. Talk talk me through it. I just I understand. I, I have a bit, I think if you if you listen to this podcast, all I talk about how, is how shy humanity is. And I have this. I think I have this very uh, negative view of, of human nature, and um, it's you know it's not a very palatable thing to sort of say to people. Like you know, I think I think we're all horrible, selfish monsters, and I, I hate you all. Mm. Uh, <laughs> you can, it's not it's not the best pickup line, but you know it's um it's <laughs> it's. <laughs> <laughs> it works for me. <laughs> so um, and I think we we can all understand the sort of the sort of selfish unreasonableness that that comes with being a human being. Mm. And Daniel just sort of takes that to like the absolute extreme. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, Daniel so is like I, the, he's the the dark side of the American dream in a way. He's yeah, the American yeah, dream, but approached from like a. An aggressive standpoint, almost. Uh, 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 I've been wronged, but I still want my dream. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's the thing like, when you f- you find out what what drives him, and he's talking with Henry mm. uh, or or the imposter. Um, he says, uh, um, "I have a competition in me. I don't want anyone else to succeed." Sure, sure. And. Uh, I hate most people. Um, it's, it's just he, it, you realise that he's always been like that, mm. and it's primal to his to his being, and he's not like this is definitely in his his origins. Mm. He's always th- thought this, and he's tripped us up until this point, and it's just learning that it's it's what drives him to to madness because if you know you can't you can't be cold hearted. And be burdened with emotion mm. without that driving you insane. Yeah, completely. You know what I mean? So it's, ho- it's horrible. Mm. Um, I have a bit of a funny question. Go on. Put Daniel Plainview in a different sort of historical, technological era. Is there any era in which he wouldn't have done essentially the same thing? Put him in Victorian London, when just at the start of the Industrial Revolution. Would he? Have, he would. 
he seems so driven and so competitive. He seems like the kind of person that would have gone out of his way to, to buy up all of the cotton mills in East London or whatever, and then and then lent into the automation aspect and machinery and work. He seems like that ultra American dream, ultra capitalism type thing that he's leaning into. And um, yeah, but then put him into like a, a Silicon Valley era, or like a, he's just at the start of Apple. Would he invest heavily in Steve Jobs? Would he try and become the COO of, uh, of of Apple? Do you know what I mean? Is there any point in history at which he wouldn't ha- pers- pers- pursue this this thing, this this ultra capitalist goal? I don't think so. Mm. And even if it was in like, you know, like a a a, a, a state run country, mm. he's he would. I think it's definitely a thing that. It's in his almost in his blood. Sure, sure. And it's 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 about him trying to find a a, a business partner and somewhat of a family that can understand that. Mm, and mm. Shares his his uh, his hatred and, and unreasonableness. Sure. So he, he he wants to be lonely, but he wants to be lonely with someone else. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You know what I mean. You know, so that so that he can continue to be a hateful, uh, bitter, mm. you know, capitalist. But if he's got someone with him, that would probably sort of burn the or ease the burning. Mm. Mm. You know, I think that's what he's what he's aiming for, and he doesn't achieve that. Mm. Um, what is Paul Thomas Anderson trying to say with this film? I am not sure. I think. In a way, it's a commentary on avarice and love of money and love of of of, have, of having things. This this very greedy aspect to everything. But on the same level, it's sort of about the human condition. What I mean, yeah, everything is about the human condition. And oh my god, that is the most ridiculous thing I've ever said. But <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, yeah, it, it's kind of like um, everything that Daniel Plainview does. He's he's trying to become better than what's around him. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I think it's about if you don't have a goal in mind, you will keep going forever. Like if Daniel Plainview yeah. was still in physical health at the end of the film, if he wasn't like an alcoholic that uh, passed out on his own um, what was it? Like a like a bowling alley. <laughs> if you, if you weren't alley, if you weren't yeah. a person that passed out on your own bowling alley, he he, he was still a 30-year-old um Daniel Day Lewis <laughs> marching up and down oil derricks in the middle of the desert. If he was still physically fit, he'd still be doing it. And at that point in the in the in, in time, perhaps he'd be investing in um, I don't know riverboats or something. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think uh, it's ult- I think it's ultimately about. I I've watched a lot of Paul Thomas Anderson's films and his his um, sort of template for a film there's always a sort of uh, for lack of a better word god yeah or religion yeah. or religious figure and there is always someone who is struggling to find a family mm, or mm. A, a, a sort of a companion in mm. some form so eli is the, the god in this thing and Daniel is the, the the one who's searching for, you know, and he doesn't. He never he he never says what that is. It's just he. It's um. It's a master and a servant, and I think that Paul Thomas Anderson is saying that if you don't have a family or a master, mm. then and you try and take complete control of your life for yourself. You'd probably end up a bit like Daniel Plainview. Mm, mm. That's the, that's the sense I got. If you if you if you're solely focused on yourself and you care not for anyone else and just you know it's all about success and winning and money, you're you're ultimately just going to end up alone. Mm, mm. And, you know he he was spiteful of life, and by the end of the film he just wants to take it. Yeah, completely. You know. Everyone else has moved on, and he's just this lonely, miserable drunk. Yeah, yeah. And if you've got no one to share it with, what's the point? Yeah, like, completely. 
So it's, it's I think it's about the search for family. I think um you know in a way it's also about the the conflict on the way rather than the search for family. It's about the conflict on the way to the search. If if that makes sense, I think it's about these both of these yeah. things. It's like what you were saying about um the inner conflict of Daniel Plainview. It reminded me of this Aaron Sorkin quote about um in order to make a proper scene where something happens, there needs to be somebody that has something and somebody that wants that thing. And yes. that's his rule for every single scene he ever writes. And you think, okay, well, that kind of doesn't make sense in a lot of ways. But then you watch an Aaron Sorkin movie and you think, okay, yeah, that kind of does make sense in, in a funny way. Yeah. So maybe that's what this film is about. It's about that conflict of Daniel wants everything. He, he wants that, that opulent lifestyle. He wants money and he wants family, but he also wants to be lonely. And that, that direct contradiction, which is like almost a, a new speak, double think type contradiction, that's that's what he wants to embody, that, that contradiction. Definitely. And he's this, this tortured soul because of it. Which is, you know, it's um what what occurred to me is is that the the film is it it, it creates a trinity by the end of it. Mm, mm. Because I re- I realised that because I watched it again for this for this um uh, for this podcast and and I watched it again and you know H W yeah H W marries uh, Mary mm. w- which makes Eli Daniel's stepson by the end of the film <laughs> yeah it Mary, does Mary is Eli's sister so that that sort of is the tr- the Holy Trinity almost Daniel mm. is the father Eli is the the spirit because he's uh, of the religion side of it mm. and uh, HW is the son and mm. it's this sort of perverted holy trinity and it's like Daniel has claimed godhood for himself because the two other aspects of it are, are dead or are, are irrelevant mm. Mm. and it's, it's just this lonely broken man it's it's so it, it, it comes together it comes together so well I could I didn't even realise it the first time and you know, you need to watch this film quite a good few times to sort of see stuff like that, mm. and it's 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 pretty it's pretty amazing. Mm. Um, what what does what does Daniel say to Eli in church? I I can't remember. No, because see when he gets the at the baptism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and he starts like shouting, "I've abandoned my child," and, and you know he's going <laughs> like that, and uh, he gets up. <laughs> And we don't hear what he says. He grabs Eli's hand and just sort of pulls him in and just goes, look, you can't see his face. Mm. And all you can see is Eli going like that. <laughs> and then he turns around and he's like smiling again. It's all very... Out. And then Eli's just sort of like that at the back of the stage. <laughs> what do you think? What do you think he said? I, I imagine something horrendously said, violent. <laughs> I'm going to bash your head in with a bowling pin. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps not quite that specific, but maybe along those lines. <laughs> It's a, it's it's it, it's, in a way that that swap between uh, the 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 business fronting Daniel Plainview and the family man Daniel Plainview and it, it, that that dichotomy that he plays it's very Gus Fring in a way, because yeah. neither of those two people Dan, family man Daniel Plainview doesn't exist businessman Daniel Plainview doesn't really exist he's not. He's sort of both of them and neither of them at the same time. And it's the same with Gus Fring. Yeah. Gus Fring isn't all business and Gus Fring isn't all family man and he isn't all um, dedicated to, to Max. I've forgotten the surname. But... In, in Casa, in Casa yeah, Max Incarcigia. He, he's Incarcigia, I think his name is. Yeah. He's not any of those things. It's that... Maybe that, that, that whisper to, to Eli that Daniel comes out with in, in, uh, just after the baptism, that's that's the real Daniel showing through. And that's something that's so in contradiction to Eli's worldview and everybody else's worldview that it's just, it's, it's just how can this person possibly exist? How can this person that's yeah. laughing and cheering on, on, I was about to say, the stage at my church, but how can this people, how can this man who's who's stood here laughing and joking and, and having a good time with all of these these fellow 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 people in my people in my church, how can yeah. he also be this man that's just threatened unspeakable violence to me? How can he possibly be both? It's that contradiction, yeah. I think, that's the shocking thing about Daniel. Definitely. Um... Touching on the touching on the the, the God side of it, mm. 
Daniel again reiterates that he is the, he has become the god figure in the film because he he finishes the film. He says, "I'm finished." And it's like the last words of like Jesus Christ is mm. like it is finished. Yeah. And it's almost as yeah. if he's say he's given the film permission to end. Almost. Mm. It's like he's he's taken full control and it's like, oh well Brit and not perversely it's like no but all the control that he has is just he's just spinning the wheel he's just spinning his wheels. Sure, you know, sure. He's he's killed everyone in the car. And has has got nowhere else to go, mm. but but it's okay because he's in the driving seat now. It's like it's just you know it's so sad. He's just mm. in nothingness by the end of the film, and um, I'm finished, and then the film just ends. Mm, mm. I had I really hadn't considered this god aspect before, and now now you mention it, it does lots of little things sort of ring quite true, and it's it's. This, this rags to riches story it, it, you can see that Daniel maybe views it to himself in this sort of um, that was my ascension from from the working man to to this god figure do you know what I mean it, it's yeah definitely you do wonder if this is how much of Daniel's sort of insanity how much of that is something he's taught himself in a way yeah. like is, is, is he genuinely deluded or is this something that he's just convinced himself of over time so what were Daniel's parents probably like then? Because I, I can't imagine you really... Like, like you said, I can't imagine you got on with either of them <laughs> at, in the slightest at all. But like, no. did they mould him into this person? Or, or is this something that he's done to himself in a way? Or is, or is, the, or is he always been a bit like this? Or a bit horrendously evil in a way? Yeah, I mean, it might... It might have been... A, like he may have had, um, he w maybe he was just born with sort of a, a tendency to be a bit emotionless. Mm -hmm. and, and he he saw the world around him and and the opportunities. And it's like, look, if I don't if I don't become very ambitious and and take this for myself, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna win and I'm not gonna get anything out of it. Sure, know? sure. Um. So and then. His dad is probably, you know, like, just rein your neck in, son. Mm. And Daniel's probably like, no. No, I'm I not going to. I drink you your milkshake. I drink your milkshake. Because um, Daniel Day Lewis's accents are always no are notoriously brilliant. Like for Gangs of New York, it was like it was supposed to be the best accent performance ever or something. It was like a vintage New York yeah. accent. But like I think I read somewhere while I was doing research for this podcast, his accent for this is like based on recordings from the time of actual oil prospectors and stuff like that. And it's like I I don't I genuinely don't know how Daniel Day Lewis speaks in real life. If he spoke like this, I wouldn't be surprised. Is that weird? It's it's no it's it's um the way he speaks is a uh, it's um it's it's a sort of it's it's RP essentially. Oh, was he British? Um, it, yeah, yeah, he's, in, he's well. I don't know whether he was born in Ireland or not. Mm. I've only ever seen him play yeah. American roles. I think. Yeah. Yeah, but no, he's English. He's an English. He has an English accent. Well, the more you know. The more you know. <laughs> um, he's very soft-spoken in real life. Mm. Which is that you know, I'm an oil man. Mm. So it's, it's just so jarring compared to how he, how he actually sounds. Um, Speaking of speech, mm -hmm. one thing that I found really interesting is Daniel's uh, relationship with talking okay. and speech throughout the film. Sure. Because until like, he gets HW mm. and he starts building his oil up and he's on the train and we hear the voiceover sort of come in, he doesn't say all that much. Mm. He, set, he sort of makes noises while he's in the the, the, the ground and it's like when he gets HW he's able to then you know he, he has to f from from the perspective of like, well if I'm going to be an oil tycoon I'm going to have to I'm going to have to learn how to speak properly I'm going to have to b be presentable to people mm. I'm going to have to find a voice for myself and he comes with this sort of very it's very it's a very memorable voice 
that, that everyone pays attention to um, and throughout the, throughout the film he makes reference to it, a guy called Tilford mm. who says something that offends him he says one night I'm going to come inside your house wherever you're sleeping and I'm going to cut your throat it's like it's very you know that's that is just taking someone's speech away it's like I'm going to stop you from speaking mm. stop and you I from disagreeing with me and yeah yeah, it's like the. It's almost. I, I know. I keep bringing this God thing up, but it's like the word of, the word of God. It's like you know, my word is, is law. Mm. And anyone who who challenges that will be will be dealt with. Sure, sure. Um, and it's it's interesting that it's only when he gets H W that he finds this voice. Mm. So as much as he may hate that, I think H W is the sort of catalyst. For, for being more sociable yeah. and being able to sort of because he has to you know he's got he's got this child now mm. that's, that's very impressionable so he, he, ha- he would have to modify his behaviour anyway mm. I doubt he's ever you know cared for a child and then this young innocent baby sort of is there and Daniel has to sort of well do I, do I change it do I feed it and then I think social skills will come into that and that will paradoxically make him very happy yeah. because he knows how to speak to people and manipulate them but it will make him very angry because he's getting emotional ties to this this small child yeah yeah, yeah. and when and when he's just so, you can't imagine how horrible that must be for this person it's like I hate the fact that I feel yeah this boy. yeah I hate the fact and that I love this yeah yeah and now he's hurt and he's deaf mm. and I'm and I'm stuck feeling horrible about it. I shouldn't. I don't want to. I just want his... Oh, he's useless to me now. I just want to mm. discard him, but I can't because he's so... You have an emotional tie to it. And yeah. Yeah. I, I like how I just referred so to the child there as it, but good grief. It. Yeah. <laughs> it. That's what I... It, it is... It, it's breathing. <laughs> Did it get hit on the head? Did you get hit in the head? Oh god, that just really makes every time I watch that. I know that that's a really intense scene where the oil derrick explodes and he's like concerned about HW or, or whatever it is. But it just really makes me laugh. Did you get hit in the head? Did you get hit in the head? Did you get hit in the head? Tell me where it hurts. Ah, oh, crikey. Tell me where it hurts. Where does it hurt you? Where does it hurt you? It's like the thing is that's what you do in that situation. So I suppose it's some kind of like weird. I don't know. It's, it's just, just that voice. Yeah, it's the voice. It, the voice is so intense, and little things like oh, "I drink your milkshake." It, it's they all just say, it, the voice makes a lot of things sound ridiculous. Yeah, um, but it's you're you're always listening to it. Mm. You can't you can't turn your ears off from it because it's mm. so distinctive. Mm. Um, and notice how like no one else sounds like that. <laughs> it's it's it, it, it is almost as if like. A sort of alien has 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 got a conception of how human beings speak, mm. and it's like this is this is what they think human beings sound like. It's, he just sounds a little bit off from everyone else, mm. which again plays into this idea that he's probably just had to learn how to articulate himself mm. Mm. to these to these people to manipulate them, which is even it just makes it even better. Because mm. I I'm just realizing this because mm. I wouldn't be surprised if 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 Daniel Plainview. Had, sort of literally, almost literally, had a list of things that he could do to to manipulate people. It's like right, right. Well, I want this land. I want this bottle of wine that this person is proud of, or, or whatever. And he, in his head, he's going through the list of okay. Well, I can do this to manipulate them. It didn't work. I can do. It's like a flowchart that he's got written down in his head. You can see just through yeah. sheer trial and error that he develops this yeah. this this method for for dealing with people in a way. Definitely, and oh, again with like his his, it's as if he goes he he's gone like, too far with the the, the the removal of speech from people mm. because then inadvertently his actions have taken away the speech of his son yeah yeah and again that just tears him up mm. inside and the scene where he's where he, he sort of confesses that he's he's an orphan. It's just absolutely heartbreaking. Yeah, yeah. And as 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 H W and his translators walking away, all you hear is Daniel shouting, "Bastard from a basket!" 
and it's falling it's falling on deaf ears mm. he can't hear he can't hear what he's shouting so he's 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 literally shouting into the void. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is what a nice tie back to our podcast. And you know, and then you get that scene where he's like he's playing about with his son, and he just walks towards the oil derrick, mm. and it's like, you know, that's that's the metaphor for the entire film. It's like he loves his son very much, but he just the allure of, of oil and money and power and success. It means so much more to him, yeah. Yeah, it's horrible, it's heartbreaking. Completely, yeah. Um, this is a bit of a weird thing that I might have completely overlooked. I know this is your favourite film, you're probably much more into this film than I am, but was there, like, a trigger that triggered Plainview's alcoholism? Or was that just a, a something that was, like, a, just a facet of his personality? Well, um... He drinks, he drinks at the start of the film. Mm. He drinks, like, a fair... He, he didn't drink. I think it was H W mm. and his breakdown with him that sort of made him drink even sure, more. Sure, sure, sure. To sort of like drown his. Sort of, I mean, when when Eli shows up and they're having a conversation, he has this big bottle of what looks like to be vodka. Yeah. And he's just like going. It's like a guinea pig at a drip. Like, <laughs> yeah. And Eli makes him a small, quaint little whiskey, and he's like, he's like, no, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is this this monster of um, consumption and yeah. Yeah, he's like, I saw I saw a thing that that's very um, it I, I think it sort of cheapens. Just checking that. It, it cheapens a bit his character mm, a little mm. bit, but it, I think it's very interesting. Uh, they see Daniel as a sort of demon. Mm. It's like he starts off underground in darkness and and in, in dim light. Uh, and then he he emerges into the light, and and you know tries to pull just darkness out of the ground mm. to make the world mm. as rotten as he is. And then by the end of the film, he returns back underground, and he 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 remains there. It's like a small demon being summoned for a short period of time and causing as much destruction as it can, and then fading back into Hades or or hell. Mm. I don't know if I like that, but I do understand it. If that makes sense, I, yeah. I I don't think that's the meaning that I I do take or I want to take from this film. I think that yeah. that that's not what this is about for me. This is about consumption no. and greed, and and the allure of power and the allure of money. But I think yeah. that is a, a really interesting it's idea. Actually, he he sort of is like yeah, he sort of is yeah. Well, is, is it his entire existence is to pull this black, mm. horrible darkness out of the ground, mm. and, and he destroys lives and, and kills people, and then just and fumbles back into the darkness like a troll. Yeah. A, 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 and it's like I think it's not a it's 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 about how man isn't a god. Mm, mm, how man mm. is is weak and 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 should never be God. To err is human, to forgive is divine. Yeah. It, it, exactly. So I think it, you know, he's a human being at the end of the day. He's not a, he's not a, he's not a monster. Mm, mm. As much he's as he's sort of trying to be, in man. a way. Mm. Yeah, he's just a very flawed individual. Um, but it's an interesting sort of idea to play about with and it sort of adds to the mystique of the film, sure. I think. Um, do you think Eli even believes in God? I don't know, because I don't know what he stands to gain from having the following of the church follow him so so aggressively, in a way. Like, he's not he's not passing around like a donation plate at the end of every very intense sermon, I, I, I presume. I don't think we ever see a donation plate, but I, I, I don't know what he stands to gain. Like, you, can, you know that Daniel Plainview doesn't believe in, in Eli's God, because like halfway through that baptism, he's like, "And that's how you get a pipeline," or whatever the line is. He's he's yeah. just doing it. He's just letting himself be slapped around by Eli, so that he can get that pipeline that he really wants. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe but, if Eli just enjoys having this power over his over his flock, then maybe. But I really don't know for certain. I mean, without without Eli. Mm. 
um, he wouldn't have got the pipeline. That's very true. Because because his his influence over well, first of all, uh, Daniel bought the the Sunday farm. Mm-hmm. Eli, Eli, get you said yeah, you can buy it, but it'll cost you. And and then, <laughs> and then he said, I want ten thousand dollars for my church. <laughs> And, uh, and and Daniel and Daniel throughout the entire film just neglected to pay, <laughs> to pay him, <laughs> and by the end of the film, it's like yeah, I still want uh, you still owe me my my money. It's like oh yes, yeah, you'll get your money. But um, when Daniel after kill he kills Henry, uh, Mister Bandy shows up and says, well, the only way that you're going to be drilling through my property is if you get baptized. Oh yeah yeah the yeah. So he has, he has, I, I think he's more of a sort of, because he's not an antagonist. You're right, he doesn't have enough power to be an antagonist. Mm. He's more of an, he's more of a reflection of, of Daniel. Mm. Mm. And, and I would say that Eli, I don't think Eli does believe in God. I think like Daniel, he realises that this is something that's very important to people. Sure. And I can probably get a, a bit of power and influence mm, over it. It's, it's, um, he's, he's a con man, just like Daniel. Yeah. Um, which is a... Uh, what, what, a, what a bleak... It is an incredibly bleak film. We, we, we seem to have, have, have talked ourselves into a bit of a, a conversational... Uh, at that point, somehow, I don't know, I've quite mentioned it. I've got, like... No, I've, I I'm, I'm running low on notes, I've got to say, but, like, I've got lots of things, like... Isn't it weird how um, Daniel Day Lewis is really tall? Like, what? What the hell kind of a note is yeah. that? But Daniel Day Lewis is so tall. You see the pictures of him stood next to like a stool in the in the, the uh, a field next to the on fire derrick. He's pissing massive. He's huge. Uh, like, and I am not a tall man, but good <laughs> God, he is a tall man. Yeah, it's uh, he's like six foot something. Yeah. his wife's very tall mm. as well. Um, his wife is uh, the the daughter of um, Arthur Miller. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Who uh, wrote yeah, yeah. who wrote the Crucible, which is a very good mm. play. Um, but yeah, he's a bit. I think I think he has to be tall, especially in this film. Yes, it's like he's a tower. He's a towering bastard of a man. <laughs> yeah, that's true. He's very, he's very intimidating. Mm. Um, oh yeah, he's just, what a, what a great what a great character mm. to 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 play with. Mm. He deservedly got an Oscar for this. Yeah, he was um, the eighth person to ever get two Best Actor Oscars. Yeah, which is crazy. Mm. Um, (laughs) It really is. Speaking Um, of film-related trivia, a bit of trivia. uh, You know that one? That's one scene in this where the oil derrick sort of explodes and it's very on fire. Loads of smoke sort of spewing off the top. Um, The Coen Brothers were filming No Country for Old Men in like the field next door. So, really? yeah, yeah. So the Cohen brothers that day during that enormous fire scene had to suspend filming and say, right, well, we can't film these scenes with this enormous, thick, acrid smoke in the background. Just everybody go home. We'll, we'll do this tomorrow. Wow. Which is kind of crazy, isn't it? I, 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 two, two, or, or I should say three great filmmakers mm. all in the one mm. sort of spot. See, New Mexico. New Mexico is just a cornucopia. For for, a uh, greatness on on screen, it's got Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul, There Will Be Blood, <laughs> No Country for Old Men. I can't. I, I I'm sure that there'll be a multi like probably every western film ever. <laughs> uh, I I'd love to go to New Mexico. Mm, it, it it does look like a gorgeous place to go. It, it certainly does. Um. Uh, embarrassingly, I think I, I think I might be out of notes. I think I might be out of notes as well, to be honest with you, Hocker. Um, yeah. It's because yeah. I think, to be honest with you, I do think I, I, I think it's been easier to talk about this film than I expected it to be, because it's yeah. not as straightforward a film as it could be, but it's also not as complex no. a film as it could be. It is just about the human condition, and it is about. Daniel's internal struggle and Daniel's struggle with and it is about struggle and, and tortured souls and all this sort of stuff so there's a lot to talk about on that front but it is also just about a bloke that buys a load of land and then digs a load of oil 
and then dies. <laughs> you know, it's, it's yeah. not a complex story. Well, he might not die. We, we don't know. <laughs> the film ends before he dies. He might be immortal. It doesn't It doesn't even matter whether he dies. No. It's like, in, in, in Paul Thomas Anderson's world, if you if your film ends and you're alone... You've, you've. That's a death sentence. Mm, mm. It's like all of his, all of his work. If if the car, if the main character of the film has got a partner or a family by the end, even if it's dysfunctional, e- even if it's horror. But like there's a film, Daniel Day Lewis's last film. It was called uh, Phantom Thread, and mm. it was directed by PTA as well, and written by him. And in that film, uh, he plays a, a dressmaker, mm. and uh, he meets this woman called uh, Alma sure he falls in love with her and they have a sort of toxic relationship and Daniel's character outwardly has to kids himself that he's strong and and, and, you know and and very sort of he's in control and very sure of himself and he sort of has this part where he he finds a woman uh, falls in love with her and then neglects her right. because he's strong. He's a strong man, and he has to sort of, you know, my craft is is what it's at stake. And then this woman, Alma, realizes that, you know, he 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 desperately wants to be looked sure. after and, and emotionally attended to. So it comes to it that that this is spoilers, by the way. But Alma starts to to poison him. Oh God! Look, 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 not look. Not to kill mm. him, but to make him sick. Okay. Because that, because he, be, because he becomes tender and sort of, uh, and sort of easier, and then that's when they're most happiest. Mm. When when he's sick and she's taking care of him, and then he goes back to his dressmaking, and then she does it again, and they just go through this to- toxic cycle of he becomes weak, and that's when they're most happiest. Yeah. And he's strong again, and it's you know it's. Paul Thomas Anderson isn't passing judgment on relationships. He's saying that, you know, as long as you have someone and as long as you have a, a, a person or a family, it's that you're going to be much better off than being by yourself. Mm. And it's it's interesting to see that it that from Daniel Day Lewis such a such a different thing of that char- that what the character in that film you were just talking about that I've not even heard of until about five minutes ago. That that character is yeah. only happy when he's vulnerable, but can you imagine Daniel Plainview ever presenting a vulnerable mm. side ever? No, no, definitely mm. not. He would hate. He would hate himself. Completely, for it. yeah. You know, he, when he finds out that Henry isn't Henry, you know, he's told Henry has his darkest, his his, his darkest sort of secret and ambition. It's like I. I I have to have someone behind, beside me, and I hate people. And then when he finds out that he's an imposter, he just is so mm. angry and just kills mm. him. It's like I don't think he could ever be anything but a, a, a very a lovely, tycoon, yeah, a, yeah. Um, but that's oh, it's such a good it is film. a good film. It yeah, tra- it translates to all his other works, and it, it, the themes are so prevalent. Mm. But, um, I've, I've, I've geeked out I've geeked enough <laughs> about it uh, <laughs> right well have you got some closing statements Cocker I do yes um, this is a bit of a long mm-hmm. one because it's a, it's a very personal film for me uh, there are many reasons that this is my favourite film of all time uh, most of the reasons are due to its quality but it goes more personal than that I feel quite misanthropic often and I'm paradoxically lonely because of it like Daniel I get bitter easily and angry, I think we all do, and for a long while I couldn't really articulate what it was that I was feeling. And then comes this film that follows one as cynical as I am, but far more exaggerated. And he shares my name as well. The parallels are very great, but very troubling, and this might be the longest statement I've given by far, and certainly the most personal. I was tempted to admit my feelings, but oops, I guess. I have no epiphanies to move forward uh, on this. Uh, Them that are sure of everything do indeed know nothing. And like Daniel, I like recognising the frauds and liars of the world without considering how much of one I might be myself. I think the important thing about about, about feeling like that is, is 
deliberate introspection, if that makes sense. That's the thing that Daniel will never have, but it's the thing that you do have. It's it's being able to look at yourself and thinking, okay, I'm doing X, and this means that I feel this way, or this means that this is the consequence of this, or sort of thing. It's that's the different. That's the thing that makes Daniel Plainview such a bizarre, horrible, intense character. Is he sort of doesn't have the capability for self improvement, whereas you do. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's that's what makes you you. Yeah, that's beautiful. Hmm. It's very eloquent. Well, thank you very much. I do my best. You, yeah. uh, nowhere near as eloquent as you, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Sheer tongue. <laughs> Um, a bleak telling tale of greed and avarice in the face of a world which won't stop Plainview no matter what. All Plainview's decisions are malignant, even ones that he tries to be kind with. A horrendous tale of capitalism to the extreme. At what point does gentle capitalism become unbounded avarice? I do admire how this film sort of blurs the line between, well, Daniel just wants to get a bit better. He wants to get a bit better in his station in life, and he wants to improve, he wants to try and R- rise his way out of the silver mine and then before you know it yeah. he's, he's passing out drunk on his bowling alley after beating a preacher to death. Do you know what I mean? It's it's it's, it's <laughs> zero to a hundred. Do you know what I mean? Definitely. Definitely. Oh, what a film. What a film indeed. Well, <laughs> it's been certainly been the most personal film for me. Mm, for, mm. Uh, sorry if I can waffle on a wee bit there. But, Not uh, at all, mate. Don't worry that's, about it. That's... That's us. We've, we've, we've done it. Indeed we have. We've got um, through it. You know, you're, gonna, you're probably going to hear an echo <laughs> throughout the entire podcast. But, uh, you know, it's nice to look at Lewis as I tell him my deepest, darkest insecurities. But, but it's yeah, nice it to look at Danny while I tell him we all love each other. Love is good. Love. You yeah, sack that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah so do we have a we have some shilling to do don't we? we have plenty of shilling to do as we always do would you like to kick off the shilling Danny as is traditional I'll kick off the shilling um, I'll do it I'll do it in Daniel Plain oh good voice, lord right, right okay I uh, I'm on Instagram at Ohio right. I'm on Facebook Daniel K. Actor. I am on Twitter at Kerzo2000. What are you on, Lewis? Well, um, <laughs> I'm on Instagram at Lewis Did- underscore Brindley. I am on Twitter at Lewis Brindley4, and I have a Facebook page called Lewis Brindley, which is my name. And that's not a coincidence. I did that deliberately. Why, why didn't you do it as Eli? Because, to be completely honest with you, even if I could engage, perfectly remember Eli's my- voice, I don't think I could do, I don't think I could do it even a barely passable impression of this character. Take part in my twisted mind. <laughs> I'm I'm Lewis Brindley. <laughs> yes, that's exactly see when, what I'll see, do. See when he see when he's he's preaching and he does the sort of get out of here ghost line and it's like he's like <laughs> you know that one? Yeah yeah yeah. That's that's what you should have done. That is what I should have done. However, we've already done it, so what a shame. I'm not gonna. Oh, well. What a oh no. <laughs> um, we are uh, hosted by Podomatic. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're on Spotify. We're on Apple Podcasts. We've got a YouTube channel. We're on Deezer. Uh, we have a PayPal donate button. We have Patreon, and we would like to thank our lovely two patrons, we would. Darius. And Chloe. Thank you, they, Darius. They Thank us... you, Chloe. You are both extremely good eggs. Yes, they, they keep us going. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, please check out uh, a lovely company called Number 12 Crochet Avenue. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lewis, would you like to take the reins I would for that one? I would love to take the reins. I love reins. That was a weird... That's going to get cut from the final edit. Um, <laughs> Uh, my wife runs this amazing business called Number 12 Crochet Avenue. She crochets, and to be quite honest, she is incredible at it. It is like some kind of magic trick. I have Many times I have watched her do it, and I have tried to do it myself. I do not understand how, she, how it works, but the important thing is she's amazing at it. She makes loads and loads of different things at the minute. She's done a couple of different things to help a couple of family members of ours that need to wear... Um, 
face masks during the whole COVID-19 thing. She's done a, made a couple of little uh, straps for the back of the head to keep those on and not damage her ears, which is quite nice. Uh, she's been doing Lucky Charms. She's been doing little crocheted hearts, which are adorable. She makes amazing, gorgeous stuff. She's been making an amazing blanket recently, which I... I right. There, this is some kind of fancy stitch that she's doing. And Right. Okay, everybody. We're, we're talking about stitches for a second, because good lord, it is some kind of witchcraft. <laughs> She's doing this beautiful stitch, and I don't understand how it works, because it's like a scalloped... I don't know, but it's beautiful anyway. There are pictures of it on her Instagram. Go and check it out. She makes amazing stuff. She is also sitting right here. This is true. She's been in the same room as me while I've been recording this podcast. She's been here... She is my long-suffering... She's been here the, in, the entire time. ...amazing wife, who I am very lucky to have. Slash She's... She, yeah. She's so our fact, sensor. let's turn the beautiful blanket on. We are live. We are live. We're doing some live yeah, amazing don't... chilling. For, for those that for those that are listening to this on Sunday, you you don't get to see it. No, no, you yeah. get to imagine it. Look at if this! You, look at this gorgeous but, but, stitch that's like scalloped and it changes colour. And it isn't it that gorgeous. I think this is really gorgeous. That's, that's beautiful. I'm sure that if you check out uh, the the Instagram for number uh, two, yes uh, number twelve Crochet Avenue, you'd be able to have a wee look at Indeed. it. Indeed, at number twelve Crochet Avenue, go and check her out. She takes commissions yeah. and she also has an incredibly beautiful Instagram page which is definitely worth a look definitely definitely um, well I think that's that's us it's uh, it's just deciding what we're going to do next week for us. Mm. I think after such an incredible epic as th- that is this film which is long and complicated and crazy and Daniel Day-Lewis running around and being incredibly tall let's have something that's a bit more straightforward and a bit more goofy I think The Babysitter you know what? I second that. Mm-hmm. No objections. Good stuff. Okay. Really. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a goofy Don't horror film about once. about um about a babysitter and a weird satanic ritual thing. But I like it. It's goofy and dumb. I'm I'm into it. <laughs> it's it, it certainly is. Um. So we'll we'll do that. Mm. And uh, we thank you so much to everyone who was on the live. Yes, thank you. And watched us. We, we, it, we, it was touching go there for a minute <laughs> <laughs> but we managed to to do it uh, and you know if you're hearing echoes you know don't blame us we didn't we didn't really think that you had to you, I don't understand why Instagram doesn't just have the option to mute the live stream if you're on I do not understand it either That's it's a very fault. strange thing it's not our fault it's their fault screw them Yes, and uh, but... for anybody that is currently in the live actually um, my amazing wife has just put the Instagram address of number 12 Crochet Avenue in the chat so check it out please do indeed yeah pin comment but that's uh, that's us that's us I think that is indeed us which is a very strange thing to think isn't it it's um I, I very much enjoyed this podcast we had some good bullshit we've had some good talking about the film and and it's live I like I like doing these lives which is weird but I like it test next time <laughs> yeah, okay, you calm down son <laughs> I mean yeah but Darius is right though we do need to do some testing he is right <laughs> He is right. We are colossal idiots. For Indeed. Not doing that. Well, uh, thank you very much for listening to this podcast. Yes. We'll be back thank you so next much. week with um, the babysitter. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see you then. Hear you then. L- listen to you. Speak to you. Hear you. See you. Smell you then. Yes. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you very much. Goodbye.